Ah! Hey! Hey! It's me, Mumford! Wow, I dropped my mask, but you know what? It's okay that I don't have a mask. You know why? Because I'm in here! Yeah, where it's safe! And you're at home where it's safe! But we're still gonna have a great time at Kid Street today! Yay! And I have a great story about Jonah and his big fish that swallowed him up. Yeah, and we're gonna sing some great songs. You know what? We should sing a song right now. How about Hosanna Rocks? That's one of my favorites. Everybody up, 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 and let's sing Hosanna Rocks! Clap your hands Jonah. Uh -huh. Jonah was a prophet. That means it was his job to tell people what God told him to say. Yep. One day, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh because the people of Nineveh were doing bad things. Uh... But instead, Jonah ran away. Where are you, please? And went to the port to board a ship going the other way. He was hoping to get away from God. He sailed for a place called Tarshish. While he was at sea, God sent a great and powerful wind over the sea that caused a storm that seemed like it would break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the sailors tried everything they could think of to save the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah was sound asleep, so the captain went down and said, how can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will help us. Then the crew figured out that Jonah was the reason for the storm. Uh, uh -oh. And they asked him, who are you? Why is this happening to us? Jonah told them who he was and that he worshiped the one true God who made the sea. Then he told the sailors to throw him in the sea so the storm would stop. No, why? The sailors still tried to escape the storm, but it was no use. Uh... So they asked God for forgiveness and threw Jonah into the sea. The storm stopped at once. Oh! 
the sailors were amazed at God's power and they vowed to serve him. Now God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. Uh, great. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and nights. Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish, and God ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. Uh, yuck. God told Jonah again to go to the city of Nineveh to tell them what God had said about them. I get it, I get it. This time, Jonah obeyed God and went to Nineveh to deliver God's message. <coughs> the people of Nineveh stopped doing bad things and turned to God. They were saved because they listened to the message that God had given Jonah. to lay around I want to rest in the presence of the Lord just like a little old puppy wags his tail when he's happy I got the joy of the Lord <laughs> hallelujah
think that mangoes are sweet I like papayas But nothing can be that sweet love of God That sweet love of God I was walking around in circles For miles an hour Trying to find my way back to my Heavenly Father The world tasted sweet But soon it turned sour
service which is January 16th 2022 we have an incredible service planned this morning we will start off by watching a thank you video from the European Mission Society it's an update it's a thank you it's encouraging I know that you will be encouraged Deshaun Williams is going to be leading our hearts and our minds in communion this morning and Tracy's lesson will still be on the theme of living a life of legacy. We will also have some meditation music and thoughts just to help to focus our hearts and our minds on God. So right now, let's just go to the EMS uh, video. Thank you. I'll never forget the first time I heard a missionary preaching at a conference about saving the world for Jesus. I was 19 years old and I was so inspired. So the night we had a missions contribution and I reached into my pocket and I gave everything I had. I mean, I was 19, it wasn't much, but it was all I had. The conference ended, I walked out 
and I realized that I had given my subway tokens and the mission's contribution. So that night, I walked five miles home, penniless, yet happy that I was able to contribute to world missions. I've always been inspired about the story where Jesus observes the widow put it in two small copper coins in the contribution. And it makes me think that it's never about the amount we give, it's really about the heart to give. Thank you for your support. And together our contributions are making a big difference. We're investing in something that's worthwhile and the impact of what we're doing will live beyond our lifetime. You're enabling the gospel to be spread across Europe to help and save lives. God has blessed our efforts and great progress has been made over the past 12 months in spite of some of the challenges. Here are some of our recent highlights. We launched Revive EE 1.0 in Odessa. It's a revolutionary, innovative way of strengthening our churches. 2.0 was launched and they've already began recruiting for 3.0. We continue to support the European School of Missions, which is a training ground for future leaders in Europe. The graduating class from this summer, already there are interns who serve across Europe. We supported the planting of the church in Bordeaux, France. It's a huge deal, the first church planting in Western Europe in many years. We have plans and dreams for new plantings, so please pray for us for places such as Frankfurt, Germany. We're continuing to strengthen existing churches so they'll be vibrant lights of hope for their towns, their cities, and their country. Last year, you gave the largest missions contribution that we've ever collected, $2.4 million, and that in the midst of a pandemic. Thank you so much uh, for, first of all, for your prayers over all the years that go to Europe that help us tons to raise up these churches and yeah, sacrificing for us here in Europe. And I can promise you, it's for a very good cause. We see people saved, we see people raising up. So I'm very, very thankful for all that you're giving and I feel we are partnering, we are in this together. Uh, we're very grateful. Thank you so much for just donating because having Tommy Corney full-time in our ministry has changed our life. They helped us get married. They helped us to just have a good relationship, be trained in the ministry. They are just a great influence and the ministry in Paris wouldn't be the same without them. That we in Europe also can uh, grow and have people working in the church full-time and that's been just amazing. Having come from the States and lived in Europe for the last seven years or so, I see that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And so we definitely appreciate the support. And I just graduated from ESOM class of 2021 and I am so excited to go back and just continue to learn uh, what I've just learned all these three years and put them into practice and just impact the world that God entrusted us with. Thank you very much for all your contribution of hopefully this September, uh, I'm gonna be the first interns working for the church in Milan. And I'm so excited and grateful to be here in Europe and to see the amazing things that are going to happen in this next generation in Europe. I wanna say thank you. As someone who has been giving to special missions, particularly in Europe since 1987, I never tire of it and I never will quit because the need is so great. And as I am here just seeing young men and women who are wanting to change this continent for Jesus. It's just a reminder of the uh, darkness of the world around me and the need for Jesus to shine brightly. So never ever tire, never quit, because it is making a difference. In Europe, all over the years, since 30 years you give and you, you still give, uh, we are able now to, to work for the full-time ministry. And uh, my deepest wish, would be to come to you and to hug you, to say thank you, thank you face to face, because we are living something absolutely great. And we look forward to, to continue this with you in Europe, in America, together as brothers and sisters in God's kingdom. And thanks to your generosity, our daughter and her husband have also started working for the church in Europe. And it gives us so much hope for the next generation and that the God will be so glorified through our work all together. Your support truly makes a difference. God has done so much this past year, and we have great dreams and many plans for the coming year. Please continue to pray for Europe, and once again, thank you for your sacrifice. Sanctuary, pure and holy.
with thanksgiving. I'll be a Everybody's doing well. Uh, we're still hearing from a lot of people, you know, who are testing positive for the COVID virus. Uh, so we pray everybody's doing good. And if they uh, do contract COVID, that it's going to be a mild case. Uh, but here we are again with a virtual service. Now, before I get into our lesson, I do want to make a, an announcement, even though I know we, we did announce this before back in December. But it's been a while since then, and a lot's happened, and a lot of people were missing because, you know, the holiday season had kicked in and campus was out and all that sort. But Alex from our campus ministry and his girlfriend, Courtney, who I think think was, I forget, she's up in Michigan, uh, they got engaged and they planned to be married right here um, in, in Champaign on May the 30th. Then after they get married, they're going to be going into the ministry somewhere. We don't know exactly where. They've been interviewing all over. They're in high demand. We just pray they stay right here in the Midwest uh, because we need them right here in the Midwest as we really strive to build God's kingdom. So we're going to we, we continue our series. We, we've started off talking uh, this year's theme about leaving a legacy. And as we do that, we're going to do it by going through the lives of, of, of people who are living for God and do character studies of, uh, of how many of the men and women, uh, how they lived and, and how they left a legacy of faith. And I pray that we can learn from this because you see the Bible 
the Bible really is not a book of do's and don'ts, right? Or sin lists and stuff like that. It's primarily, it's just a book about people living for God and how they did this in some times in very extraordinary circumstances, especially the Old Testament. Because remember now, when Paul told Timothy that all scripture was God breathed and it was useful, you know, he was talking about the Old Testament. And the example that we see in the lives of the of the men and the women of the Old Testament, those are the things that are useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. So this year, we're going to look at, at many, many godly men and women who were commended by God uh, as people of faith and learn from them how we can leave a legacy of faith. Have you ever been to a, a Hall of Fame? There's so many of them, right? I mean, there's one for virtually every interest. There's aviation and space. There's music, and, and, and under the category of music, there's country music, rock music, jazz music, and all kinds of other kinds of music. And there's show business and uh, theater halls of fame. There's walks of fame. There's sports. I mean, virtually every professional sport has one. College sports have one. Uh you know, American sports, European sports, South American sports, association, baseball, softball, basketball, horse racing, hockey, all kinds of the different aspects of motor sports. There's professional wrestling and there's like, you know, what they call it, the collegiate wrestling. There are rugby leagues and there's a Cowboy Hall of Fame, a Texas Rangers Hall of Fame and in Cody, Wyoming, at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, there's Hall of Fame for mountain men, Indians, cowboys, guns, guns makers. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of halls of fame in the world. You know, well, I looked it up, in, and there was just a Wikipedia page for halls of fame, and it just lists hundreds and hundreds. And with each, within each category, there are double-digit specialized categories. Aren't you glad you tuned in this morning to receive this useless information? But it does have something to do with what we're talking about because all of these things have one thing in common. They feature the best of the best at something, whatever type of Hall of Fame it is. Now, in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, it lists many people who we could claim, we could call them uh, the Faith Hall of Fame. Now, introducing this section, the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, actually quote Jesus, is saying that, But my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back, he said. We do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who have faith and are saved. See, God lifts, uh, lifts these people up who have proved their righteousness by their faith. They were, they were justified in God's eyes by faith, and then they were justified in men's eyes by their actions, how they lived. And that's what we're going to look at. And they were written down, they were recorded for us, and intended to encourage us and inspire us to live by faith. So let's read this exciting chapter, this Faith Hall of Fame. It's in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 4, and then fin finishing out that chapter. It says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He couldn't be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commend, uh, commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to, a, to the city with foundations whose 
architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things that were promised. They only, they only saw them from and, and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country that they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, when God tested him, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises about how to sacrifice his son, his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's son and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of, Israel, of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the, uh, the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection." Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what God had promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Wow. I mean, wouldn't it be great to make that list? Even if you were only uh, in one of the groups, you know, listed, like the prophets. You know, don't even have to mention me by name, right? Just put my group in there. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at these lives in detail this year. And we're going to look at each individual one and then some others as well. But right now, I want to focus in on the lesson we can learn from the whole. Because when I look at this list 
And when I wrote them all out individually and I looked at each life and and each example and I'm thinking, what is the legacy of this person? What is the legacy of this person? I notice that this is one eclectic group of people. Man, are they different. I mean, among these listed uh, are Abel, right? Was not often seen as a man of great faith. I mean, all he did was offer a better sacrifice than Cain did, right? Uh, I mean, all he did was what he should have done in the first place. Enoch, well, all he did was not die, which is pretty awesome, to be honest with you. I mean, only two people in the Bible pulled it off. You know who the other one is? People that you, on this list, you got people who were sinful, people who were flawed, people who had struggling marriages, people who doubted God. People who doubted God's promises. You have liars, murderers, adulterers. You had people who were very immoral. One of them is even mentioned as, as specifically as a prostitute. You have people who didn't want to serve God. They didn't want to obey God's call. They tried to, tried to get out of it. You know, when God called them to serve, they tried to negotiate with God to not serve Him. Some of them were highly educated, but most of them were not. And some of them even struggled to remain faithful. They were on again, off again, on again. Yet one thing we can't deny, they made the list. They're in the Faith Hall of Fame. They were commended for their faith. And that gives me great hope for myself, right? I mean, we often fall for the lie uh, that in order to be a person of great faith, we got to do this great feat for God, these great things for God, and live this great life. Yet in this list, some people, they didn't do great things to God. They just did very ordinary things for God. Or we fall for the lie that says in order to, to, to live a life of great faith, I've got to be some sort of a Bible scholar or expert or something, right? But some of the people on our list, they'd never even seen a Bible. So there's hope for everyone. There's hope for anyone. There's hope for you and there's hope for me. But let's take a quick look at one of the characters mentioned here. He's mentioned very early on. I'm talking about Enoch. Uh, virtually, we, we know virtually nothing specific about this guy. I mean, his father was Cain, who was who, right? He was the first murderer in the world. He actually killed the first guy on the list of the Faith Hall of Fame. So we see right off the bat that, well, Enoch was a person who had to overcome, well, uh, let's say a less than stellar family, uh, family reputation. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, it says that by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He couldn't be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. You ever heard the statement, nobody gets out of here alive, right? I think that was the title of the, the documentary for The Doors. Well, Enoch did, right? He, he, he got out of here alive. But the most insightful thing we can see about Enoch was that he was one who was commended as one who pleased God. And then Hebrews goes on to say right after that, he says, because you can't play, without faith, you can't please God. Faith is the special sauce of pleasing God. Uh, the one who comes to God must believe that he exists. Okay, I got that one. But then it goes on to say that God, I got to believe that God is interested in those who are his. That he responds graciously to those who seek him. They believe in God's interest and goodness towards him. And in his final reward, they, they look to God personally. And this just defined Enoch. Whatever he confronted in his 365 years of life, it said in Genesis chapter 5 when it was talking about him in verses 22 through 24, it says in two places, in 22 and 24, he walked faithfully with God. Now that's the testimony of the Holy Spirit concerning Enoch's life, right? God looked at Enoch's life and saw a man who, whose life pleased him because he saw a man who walked with God. So I ask for you and I, how is your walk with God? Now, when we ask that, we usually were referring to our quiet times, right? Are you reading your Bible? Are you, are you praying? Yet I think the real question of are you walking with God is far deeper than that. What do I mean? 
Well, the word walk is a, is a biblical expression for fellowship and obedience that results in divine favor. It's, it's a verb. It's action. It's a state of being. It refers to a, a manner of life that results in a person living close to God. It would seem that Enoch lived a life that demonstrated a faith that was not only in his heart. It wasn't just a desire. It wasn't a framework of beliefs or traditions. He actually believed it. He actually believed it and lived it each day. And he lived each day in harmony with those convictions. He didn't, he didn't talk one way and live another way. But he consistently and constantly and completely walked with God. Wherever he went, God walked, walked there with him. Whoever he spoke to, God was part of the conversation. At work, God was working by his side. He walked with God and God walked alongside him. And he walked with God for 365 years. That's, that's the kind of walk we all need today. We must walk constantly with our Lord. We should avoid a life that's hot and cold, in and out, up and down. We should just walk with the Lord, with the Lord in humility and obedience. Because that's the kind of life that pleases Him. A life that, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my situation, regardless of where I find myself, I'm going to choose God and walk with Him. That whatever we do, in word or deed, we would feel comfortable doing it with God standing right there by our side. You know, sometimes you hear people say things like, Ooh, you kiss your mama with that mouth? Or, you know, would you take your mama into a place like that? Because we can, we can, you know, we can visualize that. Ooh, I can't let mama know I talk like that. Or I can't let mama know I go to these places or I do these things. But if we're walking with God and God is walking with us, the question is, is would you let God know you go to places like that? Would you take God with you? Would you let God be a part of that conversation? Wherever we go, we need to feel comfortable with God walking along with us. Reading the Bible then becomes more than just searching for something new and exciting to learn, right? It becomes a path of insight into who God is and how I can better walk with Him. Prayer becomes more than just presenting my request to God for things I want or things I need. It becomes a, it becomes a conversation with someone who walks with me on a daily basis. And then as we walk along in life, one day, as happened to Enoch, we're going to find ourselves at God's front door. And He's going to say, I mean, He's just going to go ahead and invite us on in. And it won't be strange at all because, you know what? God's been living with us so long, it only seems natural that I'm going to go live with Him now. See, this is the life we seek. And this is the legacy we want to pass on. And as we spend this year looking at the lives of so many great men and women, people who walked with God, I pray that we can learn. I pray that we can be inspired and be spurred on to walk closer with God each day of our own lives. And someday, like Enoch, just walk home with him. Well, hi there. Uh, my name is Bob Dignan. And no, I am not going to be leading a song from my office with this microphone. It just happens to be the uh, only microphone that I have to connect to my computer to come at you uh, with a short message before we take communion as a group. Um, a tradition in our church is to say a few words before we take communion together and that's a bit different in these online services, and I wanted to speak to that. So it's odd. I mean, I'm coming at you from my home. We're not all together, and I'm coming to you with my current look. I've got, I've got the hair. We've got 
home renovation supplies laying all over the place. My uh, son had uh, a very sick day. He, he's not feeling very well um, from last night into today. And so what's kind of interesting and, and cool about this whole virtual church process is, at least for a moment, we get to come into each other's lives, or at least I get to come into your home, and you get to experience a little bit about what my Saturday might look like. Um, but it, it really is a shame that the word communion, I looked up the definition, um, has so much to do with togetherness, community, fellowship, closeness, sharing, connection. Um, and when we're apart like this and we're taking communion, which is something that has been passed down to us, uh, thinking about Tracy's sermon and legacy, thinking about something that's been handed to us uh, by our ancestors in the faith. Um, I think it can be easy. It is for me to uh, ig ignore the significance of this time, especially when we're all individually doing it um, in our homes or with our little family groups or maybe even a little watch group or something. So I was thinking maybe as we reflect and um, we, we heed Paul's advice to examine ourselves, uh, which is something that communion provides a time to do and provide a time of uh, meditation and reflection that perhaps we could also exert a little bit of selflessness and reach out to someone. It doesn't have to be a brother or a sister in the congregation. It's cool if it is. That's great. But I think it's more important to reach out to someone and to think about them. To think about them and to let them know that you're thinking about them to perhaps try to transcend some of the barriers that are in place and the limitations that are in place to uh, maintain some level of safety and, and reduce risk, which is uh, a very real thing um, in, in our community and in our families right now. And there are so many means by which we can reach out to people. And so I think to maybe hit more of the spiritual mental side rather than the physical act of a communion in a building together, we could achieve some of that togetherness, maybe some of that harmony, some of that empathy and sympathy that also is wrapped up in this, in this definition and in this word of communion that we might be able to take part of a, a, a common participation that we all reached out to someone to let them know we were thinking of them and, and maybe you have a hope for them or, um, or you just wish them well or um, whatever it may be. But the act of, of giving, I think, would be more important than the act of waiting around to see if somebody did that for you. I think that's the most important step. And so that's something that I will be doing while this broadcast is airing. And it's something I encourage all of us to do to take communion um, uh, into that into that realm, which is harder to do when we're not all together. Uh, we'll, we'll pray for um, this time, and then we'll have some um, uh, a song for uh, kind of reflection and meditation. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you as a community um, gathered in our homes and uh, around uh, our families, and we thank you so much for uh, providing for us, your providence. Um, we thank you that you're bigger than any of us so that we can cling to you. And we're thankful that uh, you look after us and you want to be close to us. We pray, God, that you are with those that we are thinking about and that you give us the, uh, the strength and the wherewithal, the selflessness, the courage in some instances, to reach out and make connections to those that we're thinking about and to make sure they know uh, that we are uh, in solidarity with them, even if there's an instance of not being able to be near them. We love you, God. Amen. How he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me.
loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Jesus to Calvary did go. His love for mankind to show. Well, that wraps up our service for today. I hope that you were encouraged and that you were inspired for the rest of your week and for the rest of your Sunday. And you're probably wondering, are we going to be meeting next week in person? Honestly, I don't know. But as soon as we know, we will let you know. And if we do meet in person, it will be at 1030 next Sunday, and we will be at 1509 West John. Also, if you are not able to join us in person, we will have a virtual worship service for you to be able to watch. So let me give you just some more um, announcements. We have an incredible marriage retreat that we are in the, in the throes of planning, and it is February 25th, 26th, 27th, and it's at the Embassy Suites in, in Peoria, and our guest speakers are Steve and Trisha Cannon from the uh, Indianapolis Church, and I know it's just going to be a fantastic marriage retreat, so please be planning on that. Please be saving your money. Please be arranging child care because it's going to be a weekend you don't want to miss. Also, next weekend, next Sunday, um, we will be having Feeding Our Kids, and the house church that will uh, be serving in that will be the Chambers and Santiago House Churches. So I think you guys will have great fellowship as you are helping uh, prepare bags for, for the kids. So anyway, have a great Sunday. We love you. Have a blessed week. <music>